proofreader and has also taught numerous creative writing workshops throughout the New York uh, metropolitan area. He um, attended the City College of New York School at Evening Studies, where he majored in English and Humanities. He also attended New York University's School of Continuing Education and Marymount Manhattan College, where he majored in Communication Arts. In 1978, Olivier was nominated for an Audience Development Committee, or a Delco Award, in the category of Best Performance in a Musical for his musical Journey Through Babylon. He was also the recipient of the Creative Artist Public Service, or CAPS, in the category of Poetry in 1982. He also wears many other hats. He's a freelance writer, he's a reporter, and he has also worked for the Jamaica Observer, to name a few of the publications. Now, before I continue and continue, let's talk to the man himself. Good morning, Mr. Stevenson. Good morning to you, ma'am. Now, I'm sure you uh, sometimes are reminded when people are talking about your bio, is this me? It's what? When people are talking about this long list that's attributed to your biography, do you sometimes wonder, is that me? Well, <laughs> sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I have to wonder, um, you know, when, when all those things were done, you know, in, 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 my, in my life to date. Um, but to be quite honest, I very seldom even think about it. You know, I, um, I'm just thinking about what, what, what. Uh, I'm just thinking more in the moment and things that I have to get done now, rather than what I've done in the past. But you know, so, um, I really don't, I really don't dwell on it per se. Well, you know, um, Bob Marley, the great Grio, said, "If you don't know your history, you won't know where you're going." Or words to that effect, right? That's absolutely true. Now, um, I'm surprised that I'd not heard of you before. Um, I consider myself a theater aficionado. Are you still involved in theater and cultural arts? Well, quietly, but not as actively as I was before. Um, a lot of those activities, uh, when we, for example, we founded the Caribbean American Repertory Theater back in 1975, uh, in my home in Manhattan, and at the time, it was um, it was a very um, it, it was a period that was full of a lot of various activities, um, theater wise and culturally. It was um, so, uh, as a result, I was able to come in contact with a lot of various artists, writers, poets, playwrights, and actors, and it, it was a, a really lovely period. Um, in fact, the theater was founded at my home, at my apartment in Manhattan at the time. It was with a group of artists, actors, um, Caribbean actors who were, you could say, disgruntled with their situation where they weren't getting work in the more established theaters, whether they be white or black, because they weren't being um, regarded as either not good enough in one way or the other, whether it was in their accents or the way they looked, in their color, and so they decided to start a, their own theater company. And as it turned out, I was elected as the executive director at the time. And it was a period, like I said, we, the, the theater started, in, in uh, the group started in my apartment in Manhattan. But it was also another period, it was also a period where, where when Various artists, particularly in theater, would um, gather at my house and we'd have long discussions on, 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 on about theater and acting and writing. And it was a, it was really a, a lovely period because it was a, because of the, the the level of exchange that that, that um, came out of it. And not um, just I've not really experienced that since. I was going to say. Yes, I was going to say, Olivier, that this uh, reminds me of the Harlem Renaissance. There was an energy and a fire and a synergy of the type of writers who were coming to the fore at that time, not just in, in New York, but also 
in um, the UK. And you, you actually highlight some of these UK playwrights in your book, which we're going to get to later on. But certainly this reminded me of a wellspring similar to the Harlem Renaissance period. I would say that's a fair com- um, com- comparison. Um, I have not seen it since. And um, that, even while I, because I, I moved to, I went back to the Caribbean in, in, in the mid-90s where I was, worked for about three years and came back here um, to the United States. But um, during, I would say, let's put it this way, the 70s, was was a, 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 a thriving period for the cultural arts, particularly in in, in the black community. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, two of the writers that in the book was came out of or, were one of the founders of the Caribbean American Repertory Theatre, or CART as we call it. Mm-hmm. Uh, Edgar Edgar Nkosi White and uh, Lennox Brown. Edgar White, who is still um, producing his plays is a very prolific playwright and he uh, came out of the black arts movement of the, of the late 60s and and he's probably one of the few writers playwrights right now who came out of that period who is still thriving as a playwright i mean this man has over 40 plays that he's done numerous books novels uh, poetry children's books he's he you know lives most of the time in in his uh, motherland, which is a uh, Montserrat. But um, he lived in New York. He's lived all over the world, actually. He lived in London. He's lived in uh, um, New York, and now he's back in in Montserrat. Yes, I'm. But, I'm thinking because of his presence in the in the company, the, 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 and Lennox Brown. That I, I started to, to I interviewed them to do a, to do an article on them, and as it turned out. It just evolved into something else, which is a result of this book. You know, fast forward 30 years later, but nevertheless. But it was, like I said, at the time, it was, like you're saying, comparing it to Harlem Renaissance, there were all these kinds of people all over the place. You know, these were, you know, my peers, or I came to be my peers. They would gather at my house, all the, at my apartment all the time. Trezana Beverly, who who won the, the, the Tony for, for Colored Girls, who considered suicide, mm-hmm. um, was my good friend and neighbor. She just lived up the street. And she'd come by, and, and we'd talk about, you know, what she was doing and her plays. And she, in fact, it was through her, when they were doing Colored Girls off off Broadway, that she told me that she thinks that there's something might come out of this. And as well, the rest is history. Oh. But these are the types of people that always came, that, that were my friends and peers, and we would have long discussions into the night talking about, you know, the craft. And I've not experienced that since. I'm right now pretty much living in a vacuum. Because no. most of some of these people have either died or moved and gone elsewhere. And um, I didn't experience that in Jamaica either. Mm-hmm. Even right where I'm living right now, it's pretty much kind of like a desert, a cultural desert. Mm. But And that's one of the things that I miss about New York, is that, 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 uh, the access to that sort of thing. But even though, as I said, I, when I was living there several years ago, I, I, I wasn't experiencing, experiencing that like I did back in the 70s. And, and this speaks, I think, to something that you mentioned when you were asked in 1977 to write a tribute to a dear friend. I'm just seeing if I can uh, find the piece exactly or if you can remember. When you were asked to um, write something uh, as a souvenir for Valerie Mullins of the Jamaica Progressive League. Oh, yeah. Yeah, th- yeah. And you spoke about, you spoke about the ills of recognition of the culture of the Caribbean and the fact that resources were not being pumped in and artists were not being given their due recognition. And I want to say, uh, Olivia, that the same pertains today, which is why there's a desert. Nothing has changed, really. Nothing has changed. That's the sad part about it. In fact, I think it's even got worse. We have pockets of rays of light. I'm talking about the Caribbean Cultural Theatre Group and uh, yeah. what I call what I call the little engine that could, the Brata Theatre Company. Do you know of these two? I, I know Ewan uh, MacDonald. Uh, in fact, he directed a play of mine some years ago, um, Revolution. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I'm in touch with him. You know, mm-hmm. we talk from time to time. And um, in fact, he's talking about possibly bringing me to New York for the Black Writers Conference that they're having, I think, at the end of March uh, in Brooklyn. Excellent. Yes. Uh, at uh, that, that that remains to be seen. Nothing is in you say, nothing is you know solidified where that is concerned. So it's still pretty much up in the air. I haven't heard from him, but um, that's one of the things that we're talking about. Well, I'm hoping that it not only is in the pipeline but comes to fruition because uh, I'm definitely a supporter of the Caribbean Cultural Theatre Group and their uh, productions and outpourings and outputs at uh, um, the college in downtown Brooklyn. Now, I want, I, want to, I want to ask you this, you know, as we've said before, it's the same issue. The funding is not there. How did you get funding when you were putting out this massive output of work? Because I think CART actually produced, what, like 20 plays? Um, probably. Um, I've, I've kept, I know when I was with CART, when I, uh, we did, we, we, actually funding came, it, it, it was at a time when, um, Minority theater companies, groups were were still being funded by you know government assistance mm. from say the New York State Council on Arts and the um, NEA, the National Endowment for the Arts. But all that money has gone elsewhere since. Um, it has all those theaters, you know, the Negro Ensemble, Henry Street. I mean, there was a whole slew of of, of black theater companies throughout. New York and, and, and the metropolitan area and, and, and in the country. That really, all that, the money went. It went to so-called the, 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 the LORT um, mm. theater companies. That's the um, League of, of, of um, um, Regional Theaters mm. around the country. You like your Lincoln Centers and your um, Public Theater and the Goodman in Chicago, those type of, because they claim that they were doing, they, they, they started to, call themselves, they, they got into this thing of, of multicultural casting. <laughs> okay? Yes, so that, that, was the buzz, that was the buzz term, mm-hmm. which, which, so that all that money that would normally go to the smaller theater companies who mm-hmm. went to them. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, as a consequence, well, the rest is history. Need mm-hmm. I say any more? Uh, what, what do you think, um, Olivier, about the popular popular theatre now, I'm talking about the Olivers, Shabadas, um, is there a place for this in... in there's, there's a place for it. Uh, um, I mean, it's, it is not the, the quality theatre that people should be, be seeing like they used to. I mean, they have it actually taken over. I mean, it's the same thing in this country with the, um, what they call now, uh, Chitlin Circuit Theatre or, or Urban mm. Theatre. Mm. It, it's the same type of thing. I mean, they all have their place, but at the same time, you, you need to have an alternative so that people can see what, if you want to call the it, potential. A, a term, a serious theater. Yes, yes. Now, I want to ask you, Olivier, for that to happen, where are the, um, where are the protégés to, to introduce another renaissance of serious cultural theater? I don't know. I'd like to think they're there. I know there are people who are studying to be playwrights, but there are more people who are going into film because it's for the money, basically. Mm. It's good mm. money. You can write a screenplay and be paid handsomely for it, and you can one can live on that for a long time. Whereas with the theater, it's a grind, and you really have to love it. You really do have to love it. And if, if you don't love it, then it, it won't happen. It won't happen. It hasn't happened yet. I'm mm-hmm. still waiting to see it. There are a few um, black playwrights out there. Susan Laurie Parks, um, she's done mm-hmm. quite well. But mm-hmm. they, when this, you know, there was the, the late, great um, August Wilson, mm-hmm. um, who won two Pulitzer Prizes, which is unheard of for a black writer. Mm-hmm. And... But again, somebody like August Wilson, he, he loved his work and his craft. He was serious. I, I don't know how many people are out there who have that kind of con- commitment to, to, the, to, the, to the craft. 
Well, so you are certainly one of those people who has displayed over the years a commitment to the craft, and you're still involved, even even though it's on the periphery. Would you ever come back to New York to get involved with theatre here again? Well, like I, I say, um, I, I had a love-hate relationship with New York. The only time I can see myself coming back there is if I have a reason to come back there. Well, you've already spoken about uh, a potential a potential guest appearance at the Caribbean Cultural Theatre, and I'm sure that will happen, especially after this conversation airs. I'm going to be digging in E. Wayne's side to make sure that he um, brings you back to New York, because I'm sure there's going to be a resurgence in interest in not only in your work and as a founding member of cultural theatre in, in New York, but also as a proponent of serious theatre in New York. This is one of my beefs. Um, the Olivers and so are fine. I've seen one Oliver play, you've seen them all. But the, really? the, the, the breadth and depth of your offerings through CART, uh, I mean, this is priceless. But we're going to move on to your latest project right now. And of course, I'm talking about um, a book that's been published by PayPal Press. Tell us, uh, tell us about that and how that came about, please, Olivier. Well, that, like I said, I, I, I touched on it a little bit before. I, um, it came about when, uh, just right at the time when we started CART, uh, I, I found that we had two major playwrights in our midst, and that was uh, with Lennox Brown, the late Lennox Brown, and, and Edgar Nkosi White. And, um, and Lennox Brown... Uh, there's another sorry case. Here's a man who is one of the most prolific playwrights, Caribbean or otherwise. And there's very little that's known about him, other than the interview that's in my book right now. I've scoured the internet for stuff on him, and there's absolutely nothing. This man died in obscurity in Trinidad, and I, to this date, I can't even find out how he died or when he, where he died. I've spoken to his family. His brother, his sister, well, his sister just flatly refused to speak to me because she said I could be anybody and she's not talking to me. His brother could barely tell me um, the circumstances under which he, he died. And yet here it is that... All right, so um, we uh, cut the conversation right there, but we're going to pick it back up. If you've just logged in and you're wondering what's going on, no... Uh, you haven't tuned into the wrong station. This is The Conduit Show. I am Sharon P. You may not be able to see me live in the studio right now, but I know you can hear. And the voice that you can hear is my guest this evening, Mr. Olivier Stevenson. Wow. What, what a bundle of information. Um, yes, he's serious. And you will understand why he's so serious when I get to the second part of that pre-recorded conversation. But don't go anywhere because Mr. Stevenson is actually going to be calling into the show. So make sure, don't forget, save your questions and your comments for when he calls into the show. Uh, it's uh, very, going to be very, very interesting. Um, uh, as I say, he's been around the theatre scene for some time. And as we get into the meat of the conversation now, his latest project, uh, that's his book, Visions and Voices. Let's uh, pick up the next part of that conversation as I get to it right about now. Stevenson. He was telling us a fascinating story about one of the most prolific writers, Caribbean writers, Lennox Brown. Please pick up and continue, Mr. Stevenson. Yes, as I was saying, he, um, there's very little on him to be found anywhere. Uh, you might see his name mentioned in, in, in pieces, uh, bits and pieces. Uh, there's a book that was done by the late Errol Hill, who was also one of the playwrights in the book. Uh, he has a book called The History of African-American theater, and he mentions Lennox Brown, he mentions Cart and, uh, and the work that we did. Most of the writers that I have in the book, uh, he is in that book as well. Right. But um, what I was saying with Lennox Brown, I mean, everybody knows who Derek Walcott is as a poet and as a playwright. Mm -hmm. And I put Lennox probably a little ahead of Derek in terms of, of, of plays and the types of plays that he did, and yet there's very little known about him. 
Wow, we want to say... The circumstances under which he died, even his family couldn't tell me or give me any accurate information. And it's, 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 that is really, a, that's a real tragedy. I was going to say, that really is. But at least you've documented... So hopefully, um, as more and more uh, information becomes available on the Internet, someone can do some more research and find some more information uh, about Lennox Brown. I mean, you, you, you actually um, <clears throat> mention or you feature 14 prolific Caribbean playwrights uh, mm -hmm. in your book. Why did you choose this 14? Well, it wasn't by... But by, it wasn't by deliberate choice. It was just by, it was more like catch as catch can. Okay. Um, when I interviewed Derek, as I mentioned before, he was coming, he came to New York after he broke up um, with the Trinidad Theatre Workshop and he, he asked if Cart wanted to do one of his plays. And at the same time, I took advantage of it and interviewed him. Mm -hmm. And then while I was interviewing him, at the conclusion of the, well, I interviewed him three times, and it, this was the first time. And he happened to mention that um, Errol John was staying at the same hotel where he was. Oh, they, my they, goodness. Um, <laughs> the, uh, this is a well-known hotel in Manhattan. <laughs> it, it, it escapes me right now. He'll come back. But uh, he said, well, you might want to in interview um, Errol John as well. He's staying here. So I went and I interviewed Errol, and then um, as a... As it, as it went along, I saw that this was evolving into a book. Mm. Um, I met Alwyn Bully when he was at um, the Eugene O'Neill Playwrights Conference in Waterford, Connecticut. And I interviewed him. And I, I met um, Stafford Ashani Harrison when I happened to be in Jamaica. And he was a friend of a friend of mine. And he came to his house and I interviewed him then. So mm. I really just took advantage of the situations when they when they arose. Slade Hopkinson, well, I went out of my way then. I went, he was staying in Montreal and I went in, in Toronto and I was visiting a friend in Toronto and I took the advantage of that and I interviewed him there because he was working for the Guyanese um, concert. Mm -hmm. um, Errol Hill, I, he was teaching at Dartmouth at the time and I took advantage of that. I had a cousin who lived in Boston, so I went to, to Boston, stayed there and then drove over to... to um, to New Hampshire to to interview um, Errol. Um, Trevor Roan, I was in Jamaica at, at the time, and, and, and Dennis Scott, I interviewed them a, a day apart. I, I interviewed mm -hmm. Dennis, but I didn't go to Jamaica specifically to interview these people. I, I was just happened to be in town and said, well, let me take advantage of the situation. And um, I almost didn't get the interview with, with Trevor because I was staying with um, a friend of mine up in up in the hills, the late Bonnie Ruggs from Third World. Oh my a goodness! A friend of mine. Yes, very sad and, news um, there. The taxi uh, came late, so the, the 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 time that I arranged to meet Trevor when I got to the theater at the time, just called the the, the way out theater in, in the Pegasus Hotel. He he was on his way out, and he was having a he was coming down with a cold, and he was not he was in a very cranky mood, and he. He made it a point to, to, to let me know that I was late <laughs> and that um, he wasn't going to really give me anything. So I, he said, well, I said, what about, could you give me 15 minutes? He said, all right, 15 minutes. So we went back into the theater and we sat down and um, I guess based on the kind of questions I was asking him, I saw him warming up to the situation and like an hour later we concluded. <laughs> I think the thing that really triggered it is when I told him that Derek Walcott was regarded as the, sh the Shakespeare of the Caribbean. And uh -oh. he says, well, uh -oh. Shakespeare wrote for the man down the street and I write for the man down the street. Ooh. Okay. And that, so from there, we went into a full interview. Uh, forget the 15 minutes. Uh, like I, it, 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 he was so caught up in it that after we, we concluded, he invited me to his house and showed me all his his awards and, and and even went as far as saying if I want to come back to Jamaica, he'll show me how to make money in theater. Wow. I mean, priceless. Priceless. But did you get a chance for that second meeting? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Unfortunately. Now, um, a very, a very kind of uh, unique 
perspective of your book, Visions and Voices, which is conversations with 14 Caribbean playwrights, published, of course, by PayPal Press, is that you ask each person for their opinion on their peers. Mm -hmm. what, what made you hit on that concept? Again, it was a. It, it, I didn't start out. It didn't start out that way. But as I was beginning to meet all these other writers, you know, I was curious to find out what they thought of their peers. Mm. And so it, it became like a sort of um, how would you say um, a forum of some kind, just, just to. I, I'm wondering if you opened up any cans of worm. Um, a little bit. Okay. Uh, Errol, Errol John um, went, um, took took um, Trevor Rohn to task. I mean, mm. he really, you know, mm. dug into his work and really didn't regard him as much of a playwright. Really? Really? Huh. Well, I, I know one of the plays that I saw for, from Trevor Rohn, and that was um, a production from um, Brata Theatre Company, was Positive. Uh, an ad adaptation. It was it was very very interesting. So you know, as I said, um, this conversation that I'm having with Olivier Stevenson, a lot of people are going to learn a lot, and a lot of people are going to be reminded of the history that is not out there. Because I had no idea that there was an organization called CART. Um, I had no idea that we have these people who are alive. Unfortunately, over half of the people, half of the authors, playwrights that you a feature in your book are no longer with us. Actually, eight. Eight of them. Okay. Yes. All right. Yeah, over half of them are no longer here. So, I mean, it's important that we not only document our own history and document it in an, an authentic and credible manner, but that we lord and celebrate those who are the trailblazers, especially as we wrap up now uh, Black History Month. This, you know, this really is something that... Your book should be in schools. Yes, well, that, it's, that's where it's geared toward. It's, it's geared towards um, uh, people who are students of, of theater, uh, or Caribbean theater, if you will, uh, well, theater in general. Um, I, I think, I mean, I think uh, aside from the theater, this should be a book that is on every English curriculum because I we're talking so. about literature. I think so. We're talking about literature. We're talking about plays. And, and I really think um, whether or not um, it's in schools, it should certainly be mandatory reading in every Caribbean school, much the same way that there's this push for Marcus Garvey to be on the curriculum in Caribbean, mm -hmm. Caribbean schools. Mm -hmm. I think this is the kind of book that should be mandatory reading. Well, it was, uh, that, that was one of the things that I had in mind it, um, for, for, for students scholars of theater, um, the average, average theater goer, but definitely in the schools, because I've always had a problem with um, not being able, well, let's put it this way, when I was in high school, I, I learned, we, we got English literature, Chaucer's Tales, yeah, Chaucer's Tales, I came to this country and I started finding out about people, because I had a, had a uncle who, um, he grew up during the, the, the 20s and, and the 30s, and, you know, he, I would always hear him talking about Langston, Langston Hughes, Hughes and yes. Claude McKay and yes. all these people. And I'm saying, look, and he, mentioned, he, he made a point of stating that Claude McKay was Jamaican. Yes, if, we should die, myself, if I should die. How come I didn't hear about it, this guy? There you go. Because you're in the uh, colonial system, so they don't really right. want to tell you about that. I could tell you about... Shakespeare and Wordsworth and, and Chaucer. Coleridge and Thomas Hardy and all these people. And I'm saying, well, here's a guy who came from Clarendon in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Winston Churchill even quoted his, his famous Yes, uh, if I should if die. We must die during yeah. World War II. Yes. And I'm saying, so what happened? Well, you know, um, a prophet is never recognized in his own town, as they say. And, and this seems to be a problem in, in positive outpourings from the Caribbean. They're not lauded and celebrated, but all of the negatives are. I, I wanted to ask you, um, I see that Kwame Dawes wrote a brilliant foreword for word for the book. Um, uh, I, have you ever um, participated in um, this event that they have in May in St. Elizabeth, uh, Calabash? Calabash? No. Yes. No. Um, would there be any possibility that you would be 
a participant? You, you would have to ask Kwame that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I will definitely. Um, because that's another, you know, kudos to those, uh, to Kwame and Colin Chana for kind of mm-hmm. um, spearheading that effort. And yeah, to well, see, Colin is no longer involved. Yes, just I know. Me. Yes, I know. I know. But to see yeah. how it's grown um, and to just have an awareness or to showcase the talent that's out there, not just mm-hmm. established talent, but up and coming talent to give mm-hmm. the up and comers some encouragement. Um, to see what's gone before and the standards that they must attain and and sustain. So, I mean, just for that, your book is um, an amazing gem. I've actually ordered it. Um, Didn't get a chance to read it before we had this conversation, but I have a feeling that you're going to be a regular guest on The Conduit Show. That would be nice. That would be nice. Um, And uh, in in Florida, you're you're teaching now or writing? I'm working on a bunch of projects. In fact, I just spoke with a good friend of mine yesterday about my musical, which was done many, many years ago, Journey to Babylon, and I've been thinking about um, um, doing more, see, when, rewriting it, as it were, because when I did it at the time, it wasn't completed. I was stopped because the, 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 the people who were, the current people who, the woman, my friend Arlene Kwai, who was directing it, and mm-hmm. it was her concept to begin with mm-hmm. of putting my play, of my poems together uh, uh, and, um, mm-hmm. uh, as a play. Right. And we, and we came up with Journey Through Babylon. And, this and um, a- she actually stopped me. She said, okay, you have enough here. Now. You're, you're, you're writing up a <laughs> storm. I said, but it's not finished. She said, no, we have enough. So, and it's been on my mind ever since to finish it. And a good friend of mine, Antoinette Pitkin, just called me the other day and said, for years she's always wanted to do it. And I said, well, I've been thinking about it. And I approached uh, a gentleman um, who was the um, the musician in in the musical, uh, uh, Jimmy McKitty, if he would be willing to work with me on it. And he said he, he would love to be. And he's, he also has been thinking about it for a long time. So uh, 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 I've got the, the juices um, revived and bubbling, so I'm, I'm getting back into that. And yeah. I was telling Antoinette also that I was thinking of possibly getting um, Michael Ibu Cooper to um, help me arrange the music. Wow. Because I've always wanted to work with him. Mm, interesting. He, he's the guy who really created Third World's sound. Hmm. And I interviewed him many years ago when he got his um, OD. Mm-hmm. From the government, mm-hmm. Jamaican government, mm-hmm. and I said, you know, one of these days we have to work together. He says, any time. So I said, good. So at the time has come where you know I'm going to in, I'm going to um, seek his expertise in, in helping me to um, score the music and do the arrangements for that. Right. No, I'm also wh- working on another project, which which is a screenplay. Uh, it's still up in the air. I don't know if it's going to happen yet. Um, and the life of Madame C.J. Walker. Okay. The first hmm. female millionaire, millionaire businesswoman. Yeah, which black. Many people don't Let's know not forget about. black. Let's not forget black. But yeah. um, that's still in in the talking stage, and, and I really don't want to say too much more on that. Mm-hmm. But um, until it actually happens. So, would you consider um, the the play that you're thinking of um, reviving, Journey Through Babylon? Would that be a one man play, or no, a- no, 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 it's not a one man play. Okay. It has a cast of seven. Okay. And the way it, the way it was structured was, it was called a uh, 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 not a uh, a, a, fan, a ritual fantasy poem, which was it was like one big poem, but they have these monologues of poems throughout. With a storyline, and then the character that I had was seven years, the Nancy character, mm-hmm. who is like the narrator. Right. Is, um, the, the, um, the women, there was one woman called Panciana, mm-hmm. another one called Kalalu, there's a character called Obia, mm-hmm. there's a character called Nati Rebel Youth, <laughs> there's a character called Soul Brother. Right? You yes. see where this is going? So uh, it's absolutely. images of. Uh, the uh, 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 culture. Yes, yes, yeah. And and, and, and there's another one called Sukriya. Okay. You what? know what Sukriya is, right? No, please explain. And I'm sure the... Sukriya the... is, a, is, is, a, is a Trinidadian folk image. Um, 
we have it in Jamaica. We call that, call that same character old hag, which means old oh, hag. Oh, yes, yes. The one that would in inherit your body at night, right? Right, and mm -hmm. it sucks men's blood and, mm -hmm. and um, it's almost like a vampire. Kick over the milk and all kind of nonsense. Right. Well, not nonsense. A, right, yes. so that's Sukriya. Okay, okay. So, so it was just pulling from all these different aspects of, of, of our culture, you know, the, the flower, Pansian is this pretty young girl. From Jamaica, yes. Kalalu, of course, I don't have to explain uh -huh. what she is. But they, and they all have their own, and the stories about West Indians or Caribbean people coming to New York, specifically, because I had a poem like that, which is called Journey to Babylon, this is where it came from. Okay. And all the different changes that they go through while living in, in New York or in America. Mm. I think and, very and, relevant. And, he's, and the Nancy character, he, he, he's, in, he's in all of us. Hmm. Did you know? And he goes into situations and he sees all these people going through their different changes and, and, he's, and he's, you know, everybody has a, has a gripe. And then finally, he, um, he, 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 comes, he brings them all together and says, listen, we, you know, we've all been through all this stuff, but um, we need to get a little break. So he gives them the Labor Day Carnival. Uh-huh. Which many people don't even know the origin of that Labor Day Carnival. Yeah. Again, it's um, about knowledge and, and, and knowing your history. Right. And at the end of the carnival now, because it's the play it wanders throughout the audience and all this stuff, and, then it, it, and, and the, um, at the end of it, he, he, um, he reveals himself. And, they, and the, all the people say, oh, was that you all this time? Because every, each one of them, when he, when he comes to them, with their, when they see them going through their problems, he, he tries to give them some advice. Mm -hmm. And each one of them, after he leaves them, he says, I know you from somewhere. You remind me of somebody. Mm. So at the end, no, he's revealed. And they say, oh, was that you all this time? Huh. You know? Okay, okay. But, I mean, the concept sounds great. I love the, the, the picture that you're painting for me already. And I'm like yeah. eagerly awaiting it coming to fruition. Definitely, I think that's a project uh, for you to be working with Ibu Cooper. Uh, we know that the quality of the music will be excellent. Um, and just well, speaking to I you. Want Ibu. I haven't got him yet. I'm still trying to get a hold of him, but I, I know I'll get him. I know I'll get him. Well, he's so, already promised you. Back. He's already promised you that he will work with you, so it's... Yeah, yeah well, he agreed. He said, yeah, I said, well, one of these days we get together. I said, definitely. Right. I, but I, I've, always, I've always admired his work. Mm. He's an extremely talented man. Mm. Mm. I think that they're off tour now. I know they did a world tour last year, so mm, maybe maybe this is something that can happen in Yeah, 20... well, Ibo is no longer with Third World. He, yes. he teaches at the Edna Manley School for the Performing Arts in Kingston. Correct, yes. Thank you the for that music, correction. Music um, instructor. Right, right. Interesting. So, are you still teaching? Uh, no, and I'll, that's something else I'd like to get back into. I, I, I used to teach workshops, uh, creative writing workshops, poetry and playwriting and screenwriting to um, young kids. Mm -hmm. And I also was involved with a program which no longer exists uh, back in the 80s called um, Poets in the Schools. And I Went all over the all over the metropolitan area into um, into elementary schools and taught uh, poetry. Mm. We know yeah, that the I funding that. that was that was that was really rewarding. Unfortunately, the funding for lots of arts projects uh, has been slashed, as you've said. Yeah. Um, Unfortunately. But but I think it's time for people to come together and build their own, own programs as they did in the 70s, 80s, to some extent. We, we need to be able to take responsibility for um, our own advancement and the preservation of our own heritage and culture. Unfortunately, we talk about it a lot, but we don't seem to be able to, um, to bring it into fruition. Oh. And, and, I, and I get tired of talking. You know, we have mm. conferences and we have all these seminars and what have you. And then, you know, once it's over, then you Nothing know, gets people done. go their separate ways. And that's the end of that. That's why I really don't care too much for conferences, you know, because it's just a lot of talk. And at the end of it, you know, you say, well, and now what? Mm. Where do we go from here? Well, oh, um, it's just nice having a nice conversation. And then, you know, people get all worked up and then you say yes we're on we're on the right track and then once it's over that's it it's over well and i'm not a person who likes to do a lot of talking i, I, I talk <laughs> and then i do 
Exactly, I can see that. And I know I'm expecting the fruition of your doing in Journey to Babylon. And also, I'm hoping to see you in New York for the Caribbean Cultural Theatre um, Playwright Series or Writer Series. And I'm also hoping that you'll be performing in Calabash this year because that's another place that I'm going to try and get to in May in Treasure Beach there. Um, I've been having a wonderful but short conversation with Mr. Olivier Stevenson, who has a wealth of information pertaining to Caribbean cultural theater, um, playwrights, writers. I mean, uh, this man is a veritable treasure trove, I think, a repository of all that's Caribbean culture, theater, arts. Um, and it's been my pleasure Mr. Stevenson speaking with you, even albeit very briefly today, uh, this conversation will definitely continue. And I want to um, just wrap it up now by saying the Conduit listeners have learned so much and I'm sure there's more for them to learn. We're definitely going to have you back on the show as a guest very, very soon. Is there anything you'd like to say in parting? Well, um, we've just scratched the surface. And uh -huh. I would like very much to have a, a situation like this um, repeated and to the extent where we could have other people in the conversation but people who are really serious about getting stuff done I'm really tired of talking and I'm tired of listening and just hot air just, just like the Nike ad says just do it and I endorse that with a big check <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. Bef before you go, let me just ask you one question. Um, I heard um, about the passing of Michael Abensett. Is that true? I haven't heard that. Okay. All right. So I need to, to just check my information because I heard that. Please he, do. Please do. He, because I know he was suffering from dementia. And up until last year, when I was doing some updating on the, on the bio, biographies of the writers, I found out that he was suffering from early phase um, Alzheimer's or oh dementia. Goodness, goodness. And he was found wandering on the streets in London. And, he, and uh, I contacted the theater where he used to hang out and plays are done called the Tricycle Theater. Yes, I know it and well. And they told me that he was found and it looked like he was mobbed. But other than oh that, he was goodness. okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, to check my sources because um, theater was something that I was very interested in, still am. Um, and it really has been my pleasure speaking today with you, Olivier Stevenson. Um, you know, thank you, thank you, thank you for this book. I can't wait for it to arrive. I'll be reading it and you will be coming back to be a guest on The Conduit Show. Yeah, yeah, you heard it there, folks. Um, that was my guest for this evening, Mr. Olivier Stevenson. What a wonderful conversation. You can tell that he's tired. He's tired of the talk. And he, like me, uh, in my other capacity of community activist, want to get things done. He's actually coming back. Yes, very quickly he's coming back because he's actually going to be calling into the show in the 8 o'clock hour in 8 minutes. So get your questions ready. I know A.B. Wright is chomping at the bit because this this show is actually right up her street. I'm not sure where the other arty people are, but uh, as I said, I am recording this, so don't worry about the uh, the adverts I've been playing. I have recorded this and I'm going to um, put it up there for everyone to see because the information that's here is is priceless. And A.B. Wrights is saying, Anansi is the moral conscience of the people. As also, he's a trickster, but he's not just a jinnal. He's multifaceted. And I know that's a, a thread that A.B. Wrights is probably going to take up with Olivier Stevenson when he calls in. But you know what? The Conduit Show isn't always all about talking. It's about music too. It's a magazine show. As a matter of fact, it's whatever I say it's going to be. So today, it's been concentrating on the arts and culture, something that um, with the passing of our stalwarts and our pioneers, um, who is there to step into the gap? And talking about passing of stalwarts and pioneers, we've recently reeled from a one, two, three, four punch Four luminaries in the reggae industry have made their transition, starting with um, uh, Bunny Ruggs. Before Bunny Ruggs, 
Uh, actually, it was bunny rugs, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about the ones that I'm a- aware of. Of course, there may be others. Bunny rugs. And then we heard about the death of General... Oh, gosh, his name has escaped me now. But uh, someone who actually recorded on the Slengteng rhythm uh, a conspiracy theory, because soon after that news came the news of the passing of Wayne Slengteng Smith. And then followed hotly with the news of, and this is a huge one to uh, reggae industry, uh, not just in the U.S., but internationally. This man's craft and his impact was felt the world over. Of course, I'm talking about none other than Mr. Philip Smart. Time constraints mean that I cannot play a tribute to these uh, pioneers and luminaries in the reggae industry, but uh, another time, another show. Definitely their passing has to be recorded and recognized and pay tribute to. But I know Olivier Stevenson is probably dialing as we speak. And there are a couple of things that I have to uh, announce. So uh, let me just uh, say I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to jump right into some music. And uh, there's a track that uh, Rhythm Queen reminded me that I actually brought to her attention, it's a young lady out of Jamaica, and uh, she goes by the name of Ikea. And when I was in Jamaica, I actually bumped into her. It was so strange. It wasn't strange. It was lovely to make that connection again. And this is a track that I've been playing because it is so beautiful, and it's so, it's so true. It's so real. So let's uh, jump straight into the track uh, until uh, Mr. Olivier calls in live on the Conduit Show. Sixteen and him love the sixteen. Him never read but him load magazine. Him father tell him know the rich quick team. Tell him end up with them and them like the opposing skin. Same one for plans, big and dress plain. Take a much life and never know that I creep in. I know the table and the chair turn panic. It's a joke and I'm here to make a him. He learned the hard way, hard way. To listen what his mama say. He learned the hard way. And this is the price he pays. The hard way, hard way. To listen what his mama say. Yes, and learn the hard way. There's a price we pay. Seventeen, now she just come out of school. She never listen when the mama set the rule. Every morning when we sing up on the jump bench, she come in and ride out like a yellow taxi. She catch her belly and her mom say you cannot stay. She contemplating self for that she child away. But when she check the doc, she find out that she has been traveling around with the big letter A. Hard away, hard away. Listen what I'm gonna say. Yes, you learn the hard way. And then there's the price you pay. The hard way, hard way. Right, okay, we're gonna cut that one off right there because guess what? Time is running and passing. And there's so many uh, songs that I wanted to bring you. Uh, so we're just gonna jump right in. Less chat from me and more music. That's what the Conduit Show is all about today. <laughs> If something's wrong, please tell me Something feels so strange, baby You don't answer your phone and you don't call me Something feels so wrong, baby When you're laying beside me, you feel so far Recently, I've been thinking If I'm not mistaken, I heard you call Another man's name while sleeping Words going around Say you know what me again Be tell your friends any day now Our relationship will end And let my watch Say them watch Say them on our wheel Say them on our wheel They want to see us break up Walk out Lose everything we build And let my chat Say them on our chat 
and them are weird. They want to see us break up, walk out, and lose on everything we built. Now 15 years can't go in vain, and this feeling is driving me insane. Giving you everything, even my last name. Wedding bells and a diamond ring. You don't say I love you anymore. Something feels so wrong, baby. And you got me feeling insecure. Love don't feel so strong. I guess uh, uh, my computer needs recharging because that was a cutout. But you know what? Everything happens for a reason because it gives me the opportunity to tell you uh, about an event that's coming up very soon. Actually, I have a few PSAs that I've got to let you know about while I uh, reboot my computer. Of course, we were listening to Mr. Taurus Riley and the song that's tearing up dance halls music venues across the tri-state and I'm sure in uh, the UK too. Taurus Riley, he just keeps going from strength to strength to strength. And before that, you heard Ikea. Two examples that reggae music is not dying. Have you listened to the new crop of artists that are coming out of Jamaica? The Chronixes and the Proteges and the so forth and the so forth. The music is coming back. I'm excited. I'm excited about the music and I can't wait to play so much of it for you. And not just coming out of Jamaica, because we have our own artists right here in the U.S. who are really stepping up their game and coming with some good, good music. One of those artists is a good friend of mine. Of course, I'm talking about Mr. Stephen Souza, the reggae gentleman. Uh, maybe it's because he comes from Britain, too. I don't know. Anyway, Stephen Souza wants to let you know that he's having a CD launch party, which is going to be live with the Skadanks Band. And that's taking place on Sunday, March 23rd, 2014 at The Drum, the D-R-O-M, 85 Avenue A in New York. I understand that music is going to be by our very own DJ Bandit. You can catch DJ Bandit right here tomorrow at uh, from 7 till midnight. DJ Bandit himself is going to be sitting right where I'm sitting. Well, you can't see me, but hopefully the camera will be back up uh, by tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, DJ Bandit is here. He's also going to be playing the music at Stephen Souza's CD launch party taking place Sunday, March 23rd at the DROM, 85 Avenue A in New York. Uh, music by Dimex Sound. Now, tickets are only $10.00. And doors open at 10 p.m. on that one. So, Stephen Souza, big up yourself. I can't get to play the music for you today, but trust me, we're going to have fun with your music and music from Paul Wayne. But that, maybe I can kind of squeeze that in uh, before the nine o'clock hour as I uh, reboot. Uh, let me play this track here from uh, another one of my colleagues on e to one Ear. Haven't spoken to her for a while, but you know what? I'm so glad that she brought this track. Oh, baby. Inside. 
Okay, okay. I'm hoping uh, that you can hear my guest who's actually on the line right now. Uh, Mr. Stevenson? Hello? Uh, um, I'm trying to... Hello, Mr. Stevenson? Yes. Okay, I'm hoping that the listeners can hear you. If you are logged into the chat room, do let me know if you can hear my guest who's calling in right now live. I'm talking uh, none other than Mr. Olivier Stevenson. Good evening and welcome to The Conduit Show. All right. Um, we just listened to a pre-recorded conversation, and that was a conversation that you and I had uh, last week. Uh, fascinating conversation. I learned so much. Uh, I know that I have um, Miss Andrine Bonner in the chat room right now, um, and okay. and I'm hoping that she has. She did mention uh, earlier on when you were talking or when we were listening. Yes. Okay. The the listeners can hear you. That's wonderful. Um, I'm going to go to Andrine because I know Andrine is so steeped in the theatre. She, more than anyone else who's logged in right now, I'm not sure uh, about who's listening, and I know we've got listeners in the UK and in Jamaica. I got a call from someone who was listening from Jamaica, and that's just one of the calls. Um, and I know Andrine was saying, she picked up uh, on the point when you were talking about the the play, that you wanted to revive. And uh, she picked up on the point about Anansi not just being a general, uh, that he was actually the voice of the people mm-hmm. and reflecting who the people were back mm-hmm. to the people. Would you say that's a fair assessment of... Yes. Okay. So who is the central character in uh, the play that was produced some time ago that you want to uh, revive? That's the journey to Babylon. Who, who was the one? Who is the central character? Well, well Anansi in, in, in that piece is he, uh, he, he's like a he plays a part of the, the narrator, the narrator, and, and also the conscience of the people. Right, and and Andrew did make that point. Yeah, but it's essentially an ensemble piece. You're breaking up, Mr. Stevenson, and I'm not sure if it's my end or your end. I'm just trying to see what I can do here to uh, resolve that issue because I I know the guests want to ask you questions. Um, Andrine said, and I'm I'm not sure if she's actually listening because she was actually marking papers and multitasking as she does, but she also made the point um, that... um, Playwright, there's a a black playwright says, characters call for more mythology than psychology. Would you like to address that 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 statement? Well, well, I don't understand the context. Neither do I. I think she was she made that point in reference to a comment that you you had made, but I'm not sure um, what particular comment she was referring to, and I'm trying to see if I can. Uh, get her to say something in the chat room. Um, let me see. She is, she can hear. Oh, she's, she was referring to the article about Lennox Brown. She sent me a link for an article about Lennox Brown when you were talking about Lennox Brown and the fact that he wasn't, um, not much was known about him. Um, and Andrine is telling me, she sent me the link, but as I explained, Andrine, I can't open the link right now uh, because you sent it to me in the chat room and I don't want it to interfere with this recording and, and this uh, conversation I'm having right now with Olivia Stevenson, uh, playwright, author, teacher, journalist. Is there anything else you, you've not done? Is there anything you've not done, Mr. Stevenson? You can't think off the top of your head. So, um, let me ask you: Did you hear from E. Wayne? No. You did not hear from E. Wayne. So we have it on record. A. B. Wrights is saying, "Hi, Olivier. I'm going to act as the conduit." A. B. Wrights because uh, Mr. Stevenson is not logged onto his computer, so he can't see the questions in the chat room. So, Andrine is is hailing you up, Mr. Stevenson. So maybe you want to acknowledge her? <laughs> Hi, Andrew, how are you? Long time no talk. 
Okay. All right. So, you know, it's a meeting of old friends. Um, and I sure, I'm sure you have a lot of history together because you've both been at the forefront of the struggle to preserve that culture. Andrine is still doing it. And I know she can uh, commiserate with you and, and totally understand when you say the time for talking is over. You think they could put that hot air in a balloon and, and do something with it, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. What, what, where do you see, what would you like for Jamaica in terms of the preservation of the, the Caribbean culture? Yes, a, an establishment or a foundation or an institution solely for the preservation of Caribbean culture. Well, it, 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 it's hard to say. I mean, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a very simple example. There's a word to say that in Kingston right now. It, it was built in 1912. It's been through several um, renovations and it's crumbling again and falling apart and, and the where it's located in Kingston, it's right in downtown Kingston. And um, I, I guess maybe because of the local, a lot of people have, you know, opted not to go there anymore because it's a rough neighborhood. Mm. But at the same time, the theater is deteriorating. And this is one of the last major theaters that we have. I mean, there were many theaters in Jamaica from, you know, in, in, in the 19th century. Mm-hmm. I think that speaks to the fact that those um, who really have a vested interest in the preservation of these institutions are folding their hands and waiting for someone else to take the lead. So how long are you going to keep doing that? It's going to fall down and then everyone will throw their hands up in the air. That's my point. So you asked me a question about preservation of our culture and all this kind of thing. Mm. So is it possible that somebody, somebody, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, could galvanize some of the luminaries or the talent that's there to put on a benefit overseas to save the ward theatre? I mean, that's that's what people do. That's what they did for big places like the tricycle and... and Wow. For example, <laughs> last year there was an article in, in the in the Jamaica Observer about the, um, the, the, the national landmarks, like the, the, the birthplace of Marvin Manley, mm-hmm. the, 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 the nation. Yes. And here it was, his, his house where he was born in Manchester. Was falling apart. Rock, yeah. Roxborough was practically falling to rubble. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, mus- famous musicians and artists and uh, Miss Lou and Ronnie Williams. Who knows where their birthplaces are? Or do we care? Mm. In the United States, we come to this, people come to this country and everybody is wanting to see where Thomas Jefferson, his hmm. birthplace was in his home and George Washington and mm-hmm. Abraham Lincoln. Mm. We have our own and we don't really give a damn. 
Well, I, I, you know, as Andrine says, A.B. Wright says in the chat room, it's imperative that we tell our stories or they will be distorted by those who think they know and because they have access to capital. And that's so true when it talks about the preservation of our culture and our history as well. Um, I, I don't know. I think we're, we have to start with educating the next generation, the ones who are going to make the change, hopefully. But if they don't know... Um, the building blocks, then they're not going to know what it is they have to do. So how long are we going to keep doing this? Because when you talk about educating the younger generation, we've gone several generations now. I I went to a very good school in in Jamaica. And unfortunately, it it took me to come to the United States to learn about um, to learn about uh, 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 Caribbean history? Uh, so I'm okay. Wow. How come I didn't have to, I have to leave Jamaica to come to the United States to learn about a great writer like Claude Buckley? From, from who Jamaica? Who was born right there in Clarendon in Jamaica. Ah. Uh. And, and nowhere is his name mentioned in the school curriculum, mm. my knowledge. Well, it's... Other great writers like Roger Mays, I don't think very few, if you ask any student right now in Jamaica who was Roger Mays, I can't tell you. Right, right. Is he the one that wrote, oh gosh, the name of the book escapes me now. Oh, goodness. Well, the hills were joyful together, Brother Man. Uh, Brother Man, yes. Brother Man, I actually, I actually read Brother Man, um, as a, as a high school student in Jamaica. So it is on the, well, it's not on the curriculum, but I, that's how I was introduced to Ro- Roger May. So I guess I was one of the fortunate ones. Um, I had an English teacher who, um, thought outside the box. Uh, and exposed me because she saw that love of literature in me and she exposed me to a whole bunch of stuff. So um, I actually got a, a Caribbean anthology as a, a literature prize um, one year. So, you know, what can I say? Uh, I, there's just, I don't know where do we begin. And it can't be with talking. It must be with action. So yes, of course. It's only, it's only way. we have to come up with an action plan. And, and I know you're saying the war theatre. And perhaps that's where we start. We join that campaign and raise funds, whatever we have to do. Um, but then I don't know if the location, if it has to be relocated. Why would you want to relocate it? It's, it's where it was from the very beginning. Why would you want to, what you do is refurbish, you, you upgrade the whole neighborhood. Ha, ha, easier said than done. Because, you know, because it's... <laughs> But you know, um, so how long are you going to keep it a mess? But replacing zinc fences with proper fencing doesn't change the mindset of a people, does it? No, no, it doesn't. So I think that's the issue: the mindset, not the location. For me, exactly. so I mean, I, I mean, mean <laughs> let people appreciate what they have and let them understand what it is that they have in their midst. Hmm. So you think then we should have some teams? intervention going around uh, in the neighborhood, a bit like Sistrin did um, back in the day. They were actually in those neighborhoods uh, addressing the issues and and giving it back to the people in form in the form of theater. Well, it, it has, some things have to be, be done. It was World Theater back in the 70s was thriving. Yes. People used to come to the theater down there. Right. I mean, it's it's definitely um, Save the World 2012 coming soon. A.B. Wright found the, the, the website. She found that on the Ward Foundation website. So um, that's a start. And certainly the three of us, if no one else, can lend our support because that definitely is an iconic building. I know so many people performed on that stage, um, not just from the world of theatre, but from the world of music as well. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's part of Jamaica's history and it, to just let it go like that. I mean, I was very saddened to visit Morant Bay and to see the burnt out shell of the courthouse and the statue of Paul Bogle no longer there. And I'm like, how can this happen? I mean, I don't get me started, Mr. Stevenson, because I'm like, (laughs) oh, goodness, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. I I want you to tell us um, very briefly about um, the book that you've written, Visions and Voices. We alluded to it or we talked about it in the conversation. But for those who are logged in, uh, where can they get hold of the book? Why do you think this is an important book uh, for everyone to own? We have this talent and we don't recognize it, which is why this book, Visions and Voices... I'm sure I met him in person. I'm I'm almost sure. Yes, be, because because I was um, definitely around the Oval House where a lot of those cultural plays were performed, um, and also not the Tricycle. There was another theatre in um, Kilburn or somewhere in Northwest London. Um, A. B. Wright says she did moon on a rainbow shawl in Los Angeles with Caribbean American Repertory Theatre West. Okay. There you go. When when was that? I'm curious to know. When was that? Uh, He's A. B. Wright. Mr. Stevenson is asking when that was. Probably in the eighties, maybe. I think it's, she's going to answer in a second. So okay. she, she also mentioned going back, it was 1996. Okay. She answered. Okay. She also um, mentioned, talking about the Ward Theatre, that pantomime was a seasonal activity, but it brought out the people from uptown and downtown to that location. I guess that was before that location got the reputation that it has, because it's quite close to Tivoli Gardens. Is that correct? Isn't isn't it Coronation Street Market round there? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's to, it, it would be to the west of, of, of um, the Ward Theatre. Okay, okay, all right. So I know there's a park in the middle. Um, is that right? And it's like a roundabout. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Just kind of I'm um, fixing it in my mind. Well, yeah. I mean, we have our work cut out. Um, I'm going to be talking with A B Wrights, and I'm sure we'll be communicating with. Uh, the people who are the Ward Foundation people, just to see where they are with that fight, because it is a fight, um, I can imagine. Um, that's a lot of work. Uh, that's a big commitment. But um, many hands make light work, right? 
So even if the Conduit Show can, can highlight one issue, which is what we try to do, one issue at a time, and, and try and help, and I think definitely I, for one, would love to see um, the Ward Theatre restored to its former glory. Um, and, I, and I'm sure all of the people who have ever crossed those boards, crossed that stage, uh, those who are still alive, um, maybe could think of some way that they can contribute too. I'm including you in that, Mr. Stevenson. <laughs> we won't be talking. Broadway shows used to come to the war theater back in the 20s and 30s. My goodness. So such a, I, I'm hoping that the Ward Foundation has all of that historical uh, data on that website, because if they don't, they really need to get cracking on that. Yeah. Um, Oh, okay, so I'm going to go and research on that. All right, Mr. Stevenson, I guess unless A.B. Wrights has another another question or comment for you, um, and I know a lot of the listeners who are logged in and listening, um, actually uh, you are as new to them as you were to me um, a, a few weeks ago. So I, I'm sure that they're now going to be going off to do their research, and I'm hoping that they will all purchase the book because it's something that you keep in the way that every home has a Bible or other religious book, then we really should have Voices and Visions. That's the name? Vision and Voices? Vision and Voices. Vision and Voices. Because it's it's a place to start to look at your history and to look at the the wealth of talent that is there that people don't recognize and some, some of that talent... Uh, is no longer with us in in person, but the work and their words live on. Amazing. And, 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 uh, to, just to add to that, what these writers were talking about still still holds true today. Today, absolutely. It was a time of um, revolution, and I wanted to play some of the music that was um, kind of went along with the times. It was it was an amazing time because it was. The freedom of spirit, the freedom of speech, and it was sensible speech, and it was let's change or let's highlight this, and what are we doing about this? Uh, it was an amazing period, so I'm hoping that it's coming back round, and uh, this may be just the start of a change and big things to come. And I, I just want to say, uh, at 8:26, um, Sharon P. and the Conduit Show wants to say. A big, big, big thank you to Mr. Olivier Stevenson, who is himself uh, one of those luminaries that he writes about. It's just that he's uh, pretty shy about it, I think. But um, Google him and you will be surprised at the impact he has had on culture, theatre and students and writing and life. I'm talking about Mr. Olivier Stevenson, my guest my first guest for this uh, resurgence of the Conduit Show. And I want to say thank you. And also I want to say thank you to Antoinette Pitkin for making that connection, making that Conduit link. Uh, I think it's a very good one. Mr. Stevenson, over to you for your last words. Well, um, I don't know where to begin or where to end, really, because it's a conversation that is, Ongoing, really. Absolutely ongoing. You said before that you want this to be the first of many conversations and you have my word. I'm hoping that we'll be able to sit in a forum setting in person and discuss what we're going to do. Not, not in a conversation hot air, but concrete plans. This is what we're going to do. One, two, three. Let's do it. As you said, let's just do it. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Stevenson. Once again, thank you, and I will be I will be reaching out to you. Um, I know Andrine wants to make that link with you, so uh, with your permission, I will be doing that. Okay, I'd appreciate it. Thank you so much for the time, and thank you for the work that you've done and continue to do. Okay, thank you. Take care. God bless you now. Same to you. Oh my goodness, that was. That was Olivier Stevenson. I have a caller on the line, so let me just uh, quickly run to um, some music. Yes, it's International Women's Month, and uh, 
let me just, uh, what can I say? I've got to play something from the ladies, right? And uh, there's none better than this to express International Women's Month. Take a listen. 